Hi, everyone. Welcome to the LACNETS webinar. I'm Lindsay Judevine, the Director of Communications for LACNETS. And I'm Lisa Yen. I'm the Director of Programs and Outreach for LACNETS. Before we get started, I'd like to take a second to thank Rich at TVP Live for making today's webinar and high quality production possible. We'd also like to thank our supporters, Ipsen, Advanced Accelerator Applications, and Novartis. Be sure you're following us on social media. Stay up to date on upcoming webinars and net news. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram with the handle at LACNETS, L-A-C-N-E-T-S. Before I pass it off to Lisa, I'd like to remind our viewers that these webinars are done for educational purposes only and do not substitute for medical advice. Please talk to your medical team if you have any questions or concerns about your individual care or treatment. We all have our own opinions, and these are our own opinions. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of LACNETS. And now I'll pass it off to you, Lisa. Thank you, Lindsay. LACNETS is a program by Generate Possibility, a registered nonprofit, and it stands for the Los Angeles Carcinoid Neuroendocrine Tumor Society. Our mission is to provide education, advocacy, and support for all people impacted by this rare disease that used to be known as carcinoid, an old term meaning cancer-like. The more accurate term is neuroendocrine tumor, or NET for short. You'll often hear us say neuroendocrine cancer as a patient-friendly way to say the official medical term neoendocrine neoplasm. We also say neuroendocrine cancer because we understand NET is a type of cancer and not cancer-like or benign as previously thought. While you often see Lindsay and I leading the meetings and programs, we are in fact led by a team which includes our executive director and board member Kavya Velikafudi and board member Donna Gavin, who's also the sister of LACNET's founder and executive director emeritus Giovanna Joyce and Basie. Our board also includes Mary Dunleavy, who has been living and thriving with NET for 17 years. I'm pleased to introduce our featured speaker for today, Dr. Hydira Del Riviero. Dr. Del Riviero is the endocrine oncologist at the National Cancer Institute, or the NIH. Dr. Del Riviero is board certified in both endocrinology and oncology. And as we know, neuroendocrine tumors, and in particular, paragangliomas and pheochromocytomas involve both these disciplines of endocrinology and oncology. So she's able to bring both perspectives in her research and clinical care. Dr. Darroviro's current efforts is the development of novel treatment approaches and targeted therapies for endocrine malignancies, such as advanced gastroenteropancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, adrenocortical cancer, and pheochromocytoma and paragangliomas. Dr. Del Rivero serves on the board of directors for NANETS, the North American NET Society, which is a NET professional medical organization. She serves as the NANETS Guidelines Committee co-chair and is one of the authors of the NANETS Consensus Guidelines for the Surveillance and Management of Metastatic and or Unresectable Pheochromocytoma and Paraganglioma, which can be found on our website on our resources page under NET Guidelines. Dr. Del Rivero has joined LACNETS in the past for our 2020 Net Cancer Day Symposium with a presentation on Net Cancer Research, and she's joined us for last year's 2021 LACNETS Patient Education Conference with a presentation on symptom management in both English and Spanish. She has kindly given several presentations in Spanish that can be viewed on our LACNETS website on our Spanish resources page. We are grateful for our collaboration towards our shared goal of improved equity in the NET community. Those of you who know Dr. Del Rivero know her to be an ally and a champion. Not only does she have an incredible passion and empathy for rare net tumors, she is very passionate about the rare subset of the rare net tumors, pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. We are pleased to have Dr. Hydera Del Rivero to join us to discuss updates on pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, focusing on advanced metastatic disease. Welcome, Dr. Del Rivero. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Haidira Del Rivero. I am a medical oncologist and also board certified endocrinologist at the National Cancer Institute, National Institute of Health. Today, we're going to discuss about an update on pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, and part of this talk is to focus on advanced metastatic disease. So this is the outline of my talk. So first, we're going to discuss basic 
definitions. What is a pheochromocytoma? What is a paraganglioma? We're going to discuss the clinical features, the genetics of pheopara, biochemical diagnosis, and what localization studies needs to be done, as well as management of metastatic pheopara. And I'm going to also discuss the clinical trials that are available for the treatment of pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. So first, let's discuss what is pheochromocytoma and paragangliomas. They are rare neuroendocrine tumors, and these tumors produce an excess amount of catecholamines hormone. So first, let's discuss about pheochromocytoma. So pheochromocytoma forms in the adrenal gland. So as you can see, this is the adrenal gland there on top of each kidney. Um, so the adrenal gland has two layers, the outer layer as well as the inner layer of the modella. So that's called adrenal modella and pheochromocytoma forms here. What are paragangliomas? Paragangliomas originates in the parasympathetic or sympathetic nervous system, which is localized in the adrenal gland. So you can see here the parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems that are, as we discussed, outside of the adrenal gland. Sometimes the paragangliomas are also known as extra adrenal pheochromocytoma. These hormones, as we discussed, pheochromocytoma and paragangliomas produces catecholamine hormones, and those are responsible for the fight and flight response. Now let's discuss more in detail about pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. All pheos and paras, pheochromocytoma accounts for 80 to 85 percent of all cases. So as you can see, pheochromocytomas in the adrenal gland are more common than paragangliomas. These pheochromocytomas, as we discussed, that are in the adrenal modella, they produce hormones. So they can call functional or they can also call secreting. Paragangliomas are divided into two. They are sympathetic paragangliomas, which are localized in the sympathetic ganglia that is on the thorax, abdomen, and pelvis. These sympathetic paragangliomas also are functional and also secrete hormones. Parasympathetic paragangliomas are localized in the head and neck. Most of these parasympathetic paragangliomas, they don't secrete hormones. A small percentage of these tumors may produce hormones, but the majority are silent, are not secreted, or not functional. Paragangliomas accounts for approximately 15 to 20% of all cases. Now let's go a little bit more in detail about paragangliomas. Paragangliomas, they are more commonly localized in the abdomen. Approximately 80 to 85% are most commonly found in the abdomen. In terms of the head and neck, approximately 3% of all paragangliomas, they are in that area. And as we discussed earlier, they're not associated with catecholamine secretion. Paragangliomas of the thorax, abdomen, and pelvis, as we discussed, arise from the sympathetic nervous system, and also those are the ones that produce catecholamine secretions. And we discuss more about the symptoms related to this catecholamine secretion. Now we're going to discuss about the clinical features of pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas, but let's discuss a little bit exactly what they do. So as we can see here, there is a pheochromocytoma cell, and as we discussed, the majority of pheoparas, they are secreted, meaning that they produce excess of hormones. And when that happened, that can also stimulate some of the receptors in the blood vessel. So in the blood vessel, there are alpha receptors and beta receptors. The alpha receptor, the function is to produce vasoconstriction, meaning constrict the blood vessels. And the beta are mainly for dilation of the blood vessels. But what happened with these uh, pheochromocytomas when they secrete this excess of hormones, they go and stimulate those alpha receptors causing this vasoconstriction. And that translates in a hypertensive crisis and other symptoms associated with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. That's the reason why every patient with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas needs a, an alpha blocker. And here we have some of the alpha blockers like doxazosin, phenoxybenzamine, prazosin. We will discuss more in detail about the management of these pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. As we can see here, there is a series of signs and symptoms related with pheopara. 
you all know that pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas are also known as the great mimic. And the reason why is because often these symptoms may be confused with other like depression, uh, like anxiety, inflammatory bowel disease. But as you can see, there are different symptoms associated with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. The most common that we see is hypertension, palpitations, sweating, anxiety, sometimes nausea and vomiting. Constipation is one of them, especially with this excess of hormones that can also produce constipation. We can also see some persistent tachycardia, meaning an increase in the heart rate. We also saw, see some changes in the blood pressure depending on the position as well. And these are many symptoms associated as we can see with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. Now let's discuss about what factors can precipitate a hypertensive crisis or a crisis related to pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. First, we have physical exertion, severe physical exertion, postural changes, meaning changes in position, stress, trauma, pain, ingestion of full of drinks like cheese, bananas, caffeine, beers, wines, soy sauce, fermenting on, or smoked foods can also precipitate this crisis. Drugs like decongestants, amphetamine, cocaine, corticosteroids, surgery and anesthesia. Some of the patients, the way they are diagnosed with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas is that they go under anesthesia for other reasons and then the blood pressure goes very high. Chemotherapy is also another one because that can kill the FIO cells and that release hormone. So that's the reason every patient that is getting systemic therapy needs to be very well blocked with um, uh, medications that block alpha receptors like doxazosin, phenoxybenzamine, as well as beta receptors like atenolol, propanolol. Sometimes when the uh, uh, paraganglioma is localized in the bladder, even with urination as well, that can also cause this catecholamine crisis. Now, let's discuss a little bit about these tumors in terms of the genomics and in terms of how often we see it as well in terms of malignant predisposition. When we were in medical school, we learned the rule of 10. So that means that they were 10%, were bilateral, 10%, were metastatic, 10%, were associated with germline mutation. But now we know that that's no longer the case. Now we know that 30 to 40% of patients with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas may have a germline mutation, and we'll discuss more about what those germline mutations are. Approximately 25% of all pheoparas, they are paragangliomas. And that's important as well, because we're going to discuss later that a lot of these paragangliomas are associated with other germline mutations, such as the succinate dehydrogenase mutation. 10% of these pheochromocytomas can be bilateral, especially in certain cancer predisposition syndromes such as BHL or MEN2A and MEN2B. And also, we know that approximately 15 to 25% of these tumors may be malignant. Now, let's discuss a little bit about the hereditary syndromes associated with pheopara. First, let's discuss about multiple endocrine neoplasia, type 2A and B. The gene that is mutated is called the red proto-oncogene. And the clinical manifestation of this MEN2A or MEN2B, they're different. MEN2A uh, is associated with medullary tarry cancer, which are another type of neuroendocrine tumors, pheochromocytoma, and also primary hyperparathyroidism. And I know it's a, it's a long word, but basically what it is, is that there is a hormone that regulates the calcium in your body. And when you have a tumor, which in this situation is benign, they can cause excess, the hormone can stimulate the calcium to come from the bones to the general circulation, and we translate an elevated calcium in the blood. Now the MEN2B is a little bit different because besides the medullary tarry cancer, there is also the pheochromocytoma, and other clinical manifestation is the mucosal neuromas, which is mainly localized around the lips, eyes, and other places as well. Now, in terms of MEN2A or B, approximately half of these patients, 50% of these patients may have a pheochromocytoma. And of those patients, they can have also bilateral pheochromocytomas as well. 
Now, in terms of the von Hippelando, the gene that is affected is the BHL. Von Hippelando has other clinical manifestations associated with this cancer predisposition syndrome, such as the CNS hemangioblastoma, the eye retinoblastoma. They also have kidney cancer, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, but approximately 25% of patients with BHL, they can have a pheochromocytoma. And often this pheochromocytoma is localized bilaterally as well. So now let's discuss about neurofibromatosis type one. The gene that is affected here is the NF1 gene. And the clinical uh, manifestations associated with NF1 is usually the cafe led spots. They also have uh, nodules in the eyes. Uh, they can also have other manifestations as well, like some uh, brain tumors, but approximately two to five percent, as you can see, the likelihood that a patient with NF1 can develop a pheochromocytoma is low, is two to five percent. And lastly, let's discuss briefly about the hereditary paraganglioma. The genes that are affected is the genes called the succinic dehydrogenase A or B, C or D. And we're going to discuss more in detail about it because it's important as well, based on what gene is affected, they have other clinical manifestations. Something to discuss here is that patients that have SDHB mutation, they can develop metastatic disease and we need to follow these patients very, very closely. 40 to 45% of patients with metastatic disease may have a mutation in the SDHB gene. These hereditary paragangliomas may also have other clinical manifestations such as a kidney cancer, gastrointestinal stromal tumor, and we'll discuss a little bit more about that and how we treat them. Now, let's discuss in general about all genetics of pheopara, and this is it's a very busy slide, but I just wanted to show it to you that throughout many years, there has been quite a few discoveries in the genetics of pheopara. In the last 10 years, we can see that there is many genes that were discovered and described associated with pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because now these genes can be now being clustered in different clusters. And the reason why I'm saying this is because one of the goals of understanding more about these clusters is if we can develop personalized therapy for these patients. As we discussed earlier, approximately 30 to 45% of pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas may have a germline pathogenic variant. And for that reason, all patients with pheopara, they need to be referred to a genetic counselor. More than 40% of the succinate dehydrogenase mutations, we see it associated with metastatic disease. Uh, that means that it's important that every patient that is diagnosed with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas needs to have a genetic counselor. So when do we recommend, as we discussed earlier, every patient that is diagnosed with these tumors should be referred to genetic counseling because approximately 30 to 40% are hereditary. By doing this genetic counseling also will help us guide surveillance in patients as well as their family and also help us establish the risk for develop another pheochromocytoma paraganglioma to also understand if there is going to be any risk for recurrence of metastatic disease, or if there is any other tumors associated with different genes that are linked with cancer predisposition syndrome. When to suspect pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma? When a patient has signs and symptoms of catecholamine excess, and we discussed earlier what those symptoms are, like high blood pressure, sweating, increase in heart rate, there is also increased blood pressure. Patients that have an increased blood pressure caused by drugs, anesthesia or surgery. So meaning when a patient go to have a procedure and then once they give the anesthesia, then they have this spike in the blood pressure and other symptoms are related to catecholamine excess. When there is also an explained blood pressure variability, meaning too low or too high, patients with adrenal incidentaloma is, is when we found an adrenal mass. Sometimes when we do a CT scan for other reasons, then sometimes we found an adrenal mass and we need to work out that adrenal mass to rule out pheochromocytomas. When there is difficulty controlling the blood pressure, despite using uh, medications for the blood pressure, it's still difficult to control. Whenever we have a personal or family history of pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, 
as well as cancer predisposition syndromes, as we discussed earlier, like BHL, MEN2, and F1. So in terms of the biochemical diagnosis of pheochromocytomas and paragon gliomas, it can be done either by blood tests or by 24-hour urine analysis. Um, we measure catecholamines and metanephrines. When we see four times the upper liminal normals and these values, then it's very suggestive of pheochromocytomas and paragon gliomas. However, sometimes we see a mild elevation and that may be a false positive result, meaning that it's elevated, but not necessarily indicates that you may have a pheochromocytoma. And for those reasons, it's important to stop certain medications prior testing. For example, as we can see here, certain antidepressants, such as amitriptyline, imaprimine, ansiolytics as well, some sleep aids like Lunesta, Ambient, some other medications for depression, like melafaxin, duloxetine, um, as well as other medications that has been used as well to control the blood pressure that can also elevate some of these hormones, as well as other drugs as like cocaine, marijuana. And that's the reason why we recommend to stop any of these medications at least one to two weeks prior the biochemical testing to avoid these uh, false positive results. And also, 24 hours prior testing, we recommend to stop any caffeine, alcohol, that, that way they don't interfere with um, the levels of catecholamines and or metanephrines. Now let's discuss a little bit more in detail about what are the catecholamines and what are the metanephrines. The catecholamines are epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. And your metanephrine that we can see here is your metanephrine and your normethanephrine. But the reason why I'm explaining that is because I have a lot of my patients asking me the difference between the two of them and which one is better sometimes for to diagnose pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. What I can tell you is that the metanephrines are more sensitive, meaning that is we can diagnose patients with pheochromocytoma or paragangliomas. And the reason why is because the metanephrines are released more continuously in compared with the catecholamines. Now, I have to tell you that metanephrines are the metabolites of the catecholamines, meaning that the epinephrine is, will be then the metabolite of epinephrine is metanephrine and the metabolite of norepinephrine is normetanephrine. But sometimes the reason why we order catecholamines is because on this panel we have the dopamine. And dopamine can be elevated in certain paragon gliomas, especially the ones that are associated with the succinate hydrogenase mutation. Sometimes it can be elevated, and when there is mild elevation, may not cause any symptoms, but if they're very elevated, they may have more symptoms associated with pheopara. Now, the metabolite of dopamine is methoxytyramine, but methoxytyramine is not available in every center. It's still considered research, but methoxytyramine could be used as a marker, but also has been associated with increased malignant behavior of these tumors. As we say earlier, it can either be a blood test or it can be a 24-hour urine collection. And the most sensitive test is the metanephrine, or also called the free plasma metanephrine. Let's discuss about the localization by images. It can either be by the CT scan or by an MRI. These procedures make a series of detailed pictures inside the body and anywhere on the neck, chest, abdomen, and pelvis. I can tell you that for the head and neck, we prefer the MRI and uh, for other parts of the body, either CT scan or MRI are good anatomical imaging studies to localize tumors. Sometimes the question that I have for patients is when to do functional imaging modalities. That means FDG PET scanned, FDOPA scanned, uh, dotted they scanned, and the indication to the functional imaging studies is usually in all paragangliomas. And the reason why is because paragangliomas can be found, as we discussed earlier, in other parts of the body. When we have a pheochromocytoma that is larger than five centimeters in size, because the larger the tumor, the higher the risk of metastatic behavior. Also, in patients that have recurrent or metastatic disease, it's important to do the functional imaging studies. In patients that have suspected pheochromocytoma paraganglioma with no symptoms, as well as an evaluation of retroperitoneal mass, 
by doing these imaging studies, I can also help us determine therapy for patients that have metastatic disease, and we will discuss later about these therapies. So this is the different functional imaging modalities for pheochromocytomas and paragon glimas. We have the MIVG, we have the F-DOPA scan. The F-DOPA scan is only available at the NIH, it's not available in other centers. We have also the FDG PET scan as well as the DOTOTE scan. Approximately 95% or more of the pheochromocytomas or paragon gliomas, they have so much certain receptors in the surface of the cells, making DOTOTE scan a very good imaging modality. So in, let's discuss more in detail about the molecular imaging studies. These functional imaging modalities help us for the diagnosis, staging, as well as follow-up of these tumors but it's also help us to determine if there is any benefit of these radiotherapies. I don't know if you have heard the terminology of theranostic, meaning is therapy and diagnostics. And the reason why is because, as we discussed earlier, patients with theos and paras, they have so much certain receptors in the surface of the cell. And by attaching a radioisotope to the targeted ligand, then that will bind to these receptors in the surface of the cells and it can be for therapy in a, and also for diagnostics. So for diagnostic, we have the scans as other day scan. For therapy, in this situation, we have the luthathera. And we'll discuss a little bit more detail about it because luthathera is not approved uh, for the treatment of pheochromocytomas and paragon gliomas. Something that I would like to mention here is about the different sensitivities for different functional imaging studies. As we can see here, the 68 gallium dot that they scan has the highest sensitivity, and that means that it's able to detect more lesions compared to other imaging, other functional scans, such as the MIVG of the FDG PET scan. Some of you may know Dr. Carl Patzak is that Theos and Paras is like a volcano, meaning that the concentrations of catecholamines it may be higher in the tissue creating this volcano that can erupt any time, and that's what we call the spells or attacks or storm. This excess of hormone can also cause sinusoidal meaning that the heart rate can go very fast, and sometimes because of that can cause an arrhythmia. It can also cause intracerebral hemorrhage, meaning that sometimes the blood pressure is so high that they can cause a large intracerebral hemorrhage. And also, it can cause severe constipation, too. And because of these uh, storms or attacks that are associated with the excess of hormones, it's important to use the medications, adequate medications, to control those symptoms. As we discussed earlier, it's important to treat the symptoms adequately. And we discussed earlier that the alpha blockers, such as doxazosin, phenoxybenzamine, and prasocin, those are the first drugs that we use for the management of these symptoms. I can also have control of the blood pressure. Once a patient is on an alpha blocker, then we add a beta blocker, and that beta blocker can help also for the palpitations of the headaches. Those medications can be metoprolol, atenolol, propanolol. Calcium channel blockers can also be used as anlodipine, nifedipine. Sometimes we add that when we are unable to control the blood pressure. And there is a medication called methyrosine. So methyrosine uh, like blocks the uh, production of catecholamines. However, it's very expensive and is usually not accessible. Moreover, uh, the methyrosine ha has other severe adverse events, so it can cause severe de fatigue, depression. So I think it's important that whoever is prescribing methyrosine can follow you very closely as well, but sometimes it can be added uh, to the other medications if we still are unable to control the symptoms. Once the pheochromocytoma is resected, so what do we do after that? And our recommendations is that after the pheo is resected, we need to check the biochemistry anywhere from four to eight weeks after the surgery in patients that we don't know if it has a germline mutation, meaning that this is sporadic, we recommend to continue the um, biochemistry, meaning the hormone catecholamines and, and plasma free metanephrines every year. And consider more imaging studies if the pheo or paragon gliomas are greater than four or five centimeters in size, young age, or extra adrenal. So these are the recommendations of what to do as a follow-up. 
Now, if we have a pheochromocytoma that is associated with this uh, cancer predisposition syndrome, such as BHL, NF1, rat, so now in these situations, uh, the animal biochemistry is recommended. And also, we need to follow the imaging guidelines according to ver the specific cancer predisposition syndromes. Now, in, uh, in regards to pheochromocytomas and paragon gliomas associated with succinate dehydrogenase mutation, it's recommended to do a biochemistry every six months and then every year for the lifetime. And also, in, in patients with these mutations, it's important to obtain a full body CT scan or MRI that can help us also localize if there is any other tumors throughout the body as well. And usually those scans can be done every one to two years. I think there was still a, a discussion of how often we need to do surveillance scans in patients that are either carriers for this mutation of the tumor was resected and then how do we follow these patients. But overall it's recommended to do the full body scans every one to two years. In regards to clinical predictors of malignancy, it still is not standardized on which patients that have pheochromocytoma and paragon glioma has degrees of metastasis. So we still don't have these clinical predictors of who's going to develop a metastatic disease. However, there has been some data that if the tumor is greater than five centimeters in size for pheochromocytomas, or greater than four centimeters in size paragon glioma has also a greater risk of metastasis. The extradrenal location is also a factor, meaning the paragon gliomas, not the pheochromocytomas. As we discussed as well, the SDHB-related paragon gliomas has the highest uh, potential for metastasis as well as methoxytyramine levels, even though I don't think this is very well delineated about being a clinical predictor of malignancy because this blood test is still considered research and still there has been associated with a malignant potential. So I think that there's still a lot to study, a lot to, more to understand about which patient of pheochromocytomas and paragon gliomas can develop malignant disease. Now let's discuss about the management of advanced or metastatic disease. As we discussed first, always the alpha blocker first, then the beta blocker or calcium channel blockers to help control some of the symptoms. But it's important to understand the burden of disease of a patient that has pheochromocytoma and paragon glioma, the disease growth, as well as where the location of the tumor is. As for most neuroendocrine tumors, that's very important to help us delineate what would be the best treatment. For example, if we have a patient that has localized advanced or resectable disease, we can observe if the, if the tumor is slow growing. Some of these tumors can be slow growing, and in those situations, no intervention is needed. We can also resect most of the tumors, cytoreductive surgery, TKIs, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, those are medications that block the blood vessels, such as sunitinib, kawasantinib, axitinib that can be recommended in certain patients. MIVG is also on the table as well as luthotherum. However, if the patient have a distant metastasis or larger volume of disease, the other therapies are indicated for the management of metastatic viopara. Uh, systemic chemotherapy such as CBD, so CBD stands for cyclomophosphamide being crazy and the carbacin, tyrosine kinase inhibitors as well, MIVG, Luthathera. In, in these situations, so clinical trial is also encouraged as well for patients with FIAS and PARAS. However, there is only one approved agent for the management of these tumors, and that is the MIVG treatment. And that was recently approved in 2018 by the FDA. So how this treatment was approved, let me just discuss and explain to you what flop plot is. And this is what we see here on your left. Here we have this line, so each line represents one patient. On the y-axis, it represents how much the tumor is shrinking with this treatment. And as we can see, there is some patients that responded to the treatment, meaning that some of the tumors shrink, but also the difference between the black and the white is that patients have response to the blood pressure medication. So, and that was the primary objective for the study by giving this treatment, can I reduce the antihypertensive medications given to patients? And they met the primary endpoint of the study. Moreover, we hear here the Kaplan-Meier curves. So the X axis is overall the survival in days and months. 
Uh, and here we can see on the y-axis what is overall the survival, the percentage of survivals. Patients that receive one dose, as we can see here, has an overall survival. And with one dose, it was 18 months. However, with two doses of MIBG, you can see that there is a prolonged overall survival. And because of all that information, this MIBG was approved by the FDA. And when do we use MIBG? It's considered in patients that require systemic therapies, but also has avid MIBG, meaning that the patient is to have a positive MIBG scan. When do we recommend chemotherapy? And when I say chemotherapy with CBD, what CBD is, is cyclophosphamide, Christian, and the carfacine. The other chemotherapy that has been recommended in patients with theopara is temozolomide. But the recommendations of using chemotherapy is usually for those patients that have more rapidly disease, that have wall cure disease as well. I have to say that I was fortunate to be part of the NANETS consensus guidelines for pheochromocytomas and paragon gliomas on in how to make the recommendations for metastatic disease. Other treatments that are recommended as well for patients with advanced metastatic pheochromocytomas and paragon gliomas are the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And as we discussed earlier, the tyrosine kinase are drugs that block the blood vessel supply to the tumor. We have a few of them that has been tested in patients with these tumors. We have axitinib, and there is a study that is run by Dr. Fojo for the treatment of advanced or unresectable pheochromocytomas and paragon gliomas, as well as cabosantinib. There is still an ongoing study with Dr. Jimenez of cabosantinib. Uh, as we discussed earlier, what this is a water flow plot, and these are one square is each one patient. And we can see here that this is how much the tumors shrink while the patients were on the study. And the recommendations of using these drugs, either with axitinib or caposantinib, is for those patients that are non-avid on MIBG, that have contraindications of MIBG therapy, such as bone marrow suppression, suitable metastases, or for any patients with rapid progression as well. It was recently discussed at the ESMO meeting last year of the first international study of malignant pheochromocytomas and paragon gliomas with sunitinib. This is the first prospective study of the TKI for this tumor type. And as we discuss here, what the waterfall plot, this is the percentage of patient survival. And here we can see also the time either on days or months. The red line is the sunitinib, the blue line is the placebo, and patients that were on sunitinib did better, have a prolonged uh, a progression free survival. And we can see here that there is a benefit of sunitinib comparing to placebo. Sometimes I get the question about immunotherapy. When do we use immunotherapy? And I know that Dr. Jimenez recently published about a phase two study of immunotherapy for patients with pheochromocytomas and paragon gliomas. And even though they may so patients that may have some activity, we still recommend immunotherapy in the setting of the clinical trial. It's possible that they may have some activity based on which mutations they have, but still we recommend or to be limited uh, for clinical trials. Now let's summarize a little bit about how do we manage a metastatic or unresectable pheochromocytomas and paragon gliomas first. We need to determine what is the bulk of disease, what is the growth rate. And if we have a patient that have a rapid progression in bulky disease and is symptomatic, so the recommendation is to start chemotherapy. And we discussed earlier the chemotherapy that we use for this patient is a combination of cyclophosphamide being crazy and the carvacine. However, if we see progression after this treatment, then other drugs that are recommended are the TKIs like sunitinib, cabosantinib, or axitinib. Now, if we have a patient that has a slow or moderate progression of disease and they're symptomatic as well with the excess of hormones, we can recommend MIVG. So MIVG has very good activity to control the hormone excess. And as we discussed earlier, it was approved because there was the primary objective of decrease the antihypertensive medication by 50%. And patients that doesn't have a positive MIVG, then we recommend a tyrosine kinase, such as the ones that we discussed earlier, the sunitinib, cabosantinib, or axitinib. And if there is evidence of disease progression at this point, we can always go to chemotherapy, but also in this 
since pheochromocytomas and paraganglioma is a rare disease, we also encourage clinical trials. Now let's discuss briefly what is the clinical trials available for metastatic pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. But before discussing that, I think a lot of you are familiar with Dr. Carl Patzak. At the, we work together here at the NIH, and he has a study of the diagnosis and pathophysiology and molecular biology of patients with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. This study has been here at the NIH for many years, and he has been able to see patients in our clinic and do necessary studies for the diagnosis and establish um, a treatment guidelines as well. As we discussed earlier, approximately 95% of more patients with these tumors may express uh, somatostatin receptors in the surface of the cells, and they may be even a better scan to detect the different tumors in the body. And because of that, there is currently an ongoing study with Luthathera for patients with advanced or metastatic pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas, very similarly to the management of neuroendocrine tumors with Luthathera, they are a total of four cycles, and each cycle is given every two months. The patients need to be older than 18 and also needs to have a positive dot that they scan in order to be eligible for the study. The question that they would like to answer with this study is, if by giving this treatment can that stabilize the tumor and that's what it is progression-free survival, which is the percentage of people who did not have new tumor growth or cancer spread during or after treatment. There are other questions that Dr. Lin would like to answer, who is the PI of the study here at the NIH, uh, the response rate, how much the, uh, the percentage of patients whose cancer shrink, and also the overall survival which is the amount of time that a patient is alive after the start of this treatment. There are other questions that Dr. Lin would like to answer, such as uh, understand if they have any effect on the hormones as well and the quality of life, and also any effect on decreasing the blood pressure medication. I have to say this is also very promising as well that besides having treatment with Luthathera for older patients, we also have a treatment with Luthathera for pediatric patients, and that's another P. So this includes patients 12 to 18, and the criteria, the eligibility criteria, is that they need to have a positive dot at the scans in order to be eligible. Similarly, they also receive four cycles and one cycle every two months. And the question that they would like to answer is efficacy of Luthathera in uh, the pediatric population, but also understand the safety as well and tolerability in the pediatric population. This is a multi-center international study. There are different centers within the United States where they have the trial available. And a University of Kentucky, Dr. Shahan, is actually a leading the study there at her institution. I also have to say that I'm fortunate to co-chair the study with Dr. Perez. And Dr. Perez is a Dana Farber, and this study is a randomized study of temozolomide versus temozolomide in combination with a lab rep. And the reason why we wanted to do the combination is we wanted to understand if by giving a lab rep, could that make temozolomide more effective? Patients are randomized either to the combination treatment or to receive temozolomide alone. And one of the questions that we want to answer by this study is to understand if by giving this treatment, could that stabilize the tumors, meaning progression-free survival? Other questions that we would like to answer is also how long the patient lives by during or after the treatment, and also the response rate, meaning if the, is this treatment is able to shrink the tumors. Other clinical studies we discussed earlier is cabozantinib for patients with metastatic theopara. Dr. Jimenez is the one who is running this study, and the cabozantinib is given once a day, and every cycle is every four weeks. And the question that he would like to answer is to understand the, by giving this treatment, can the tumor shrink? Other question that he would like to answer if by giving this treatment, if it can stabilize the tumor, or it can also control the blood pressure as well, or to correlate response with the hormones that the tumors produce. There is another study with a TKI, so cabosantin, as we discussed, is a tyrosine kinase inhibitors. The tyrosine kinase blocks the blood vessel supply to the tumor. Axitinib is another similar drug, is another TKI. As we discussed earlier, axitinib and cabozantinib can be given in the management of metastatic neuroendocrine tumors, but there's still ongoing studies to determine its efficacy. 
Dr. Tito Fojo, he's at Columbia University, has a study of axitinib for patients with this tumor type, and he's currently enrolling patients. The axitinib is given twice a day, every 12 hours. And the question that he would like to answer is, if by giving this treatment, can the tumor shrink and uh, stabilize as well, uh, and for how long? And that's what we know, progression-free survival. He also have another study of Lanreotide. This is called the Lamparis study. And the reason why he wants to do this study is because even the NCCA guidelines recommend Lanreotide as a treatment for these tumors. However, there's still mixed results in terms of his efficacy. This is the reason why Dr. Fojo wants to do this study prospectively to really understand if by giving Lanreotide, can that stabilize the tumor? Can that decrease the growth rate. And that's his primary objective, is by giving this treatment can decrease the tumor growth. Other questions that he would like to answer, if by giving this treatment, can the tumor shrink? Can it also stabilize the tumor as well? And I think this is an interesting study because we don't have a study of Landriotide with prospectively for this tumor type. So this study can definitely help answer some of the questions that we have. This is another study. I'm actually excited about this study. It's a multicenter international study of Belsutifant that was recently approved for the management of BHL-related tumors, such as kidney cancer, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, and the CNS and mangioblastoma. Now there is an ongoing study that has been active now for a few months here in the United States and for the treatment of advanced somatostatic pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas, but also for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Another fact why I'm so excited about this tumor is it also includes younger patients, 12 years and older. And as we discussed earlier, patients that have pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas, uh, especially with SDH mutations, we can see that the presentation of disease can be in the pediatric ages. These patients will either be on the group of pheochromocytomas or on the group of the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And the question that this study would like to answer is by giving this treatment, could that shrink the tumors? This is a multicenter study. There are various institutions in the United States uh, where the study is open. One of them is Vanderbilt, which is uh, Dr. Das is the in principal investigator leading the study there at Vanderbilt and also MD Anderson with Dr. Jimenez. But there are other centers within the United States where the study is open. Another study for pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas currently available is a, a study with a vaccine in combination with nivolumab, which is a type of immunotherapy for patients with adrenocortical cancer, which is another tumor in the adrenal gland, and for patients with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. This is a phase one, two study. I have to say that LACNES has very good videos that explained the different phases in clinical trials, and I would definitely recommend for you to go there and review some of these videos because you can really understand the difference, what it is phase one versus phase two, et cetera. Basically, Phase one is the safety of the drug, if the drug is safe. Once we establish what is this safe dose, then it's moved to the phase two study. Also, there is some preliminary efficacy, preliminary data of efficacy, and also it could be as well in a very specific tumor type. So they have the phase one part of the study, which definitely what we discuss is for to determine what is a safe dose. They're only going to roll patients with adrenocortical cancer as well with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. And then they will move to the phase two study and they will have two cohorts, one for ACC and one for pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. This is a relative very new study. And the reason why they want to give this vaccine is because they wanted to stimulate the immune system, activating some of the cells, so that way when you give immunotherapy, it could be more effective. So this is a question that they would like to answer. Lastly, I would like to discuss about the pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas therapeutic programs at the NIH. We call it the PPTP. This is a program that is also run by Dr. Carl Patzak. We have uh, studies available only for as a natural history as well as a, a treatment trials available at the NIH. We have two natural history. We discuss about the study that Dr. Patsa has with the diagnosis of pathophysiology and molecular biology for Fiopara. Also, the investigator of another study, which is also a natural history study of neuroendocrine tumors. My focus is mainly oncological focus. Uh, Dr. Passa wants to study the disease for uh, longitudinally for long periods of time. 
these studies can definitely help us understand more about the biology of pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. We also have two active studies. One is Luthathera. Dr. Franklin is the PI of the study and the Temasolamide versus Temasolamide elaborate where I serve as a chair of the study. They're currently active here at the NIH and we're a Korean patient. We soon are going to have the Vilsutifan study open here at the NIH, as well as the Landria site study. I have to say that these are the most studies that any center has in the United States. And we're very excited about this program to be able to help patients with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. At the NIH, we see patients pediatric as well as adult patients. We have a multidisciplinary team that assess all of these patients and between an endocrinology and oncology, pathology and so forth that we meet in order to discuss cases as well and in order to determine what will be the best treatment for these patients. Uh, take home points. We discuss the pheochromocytoma and paragangliomas are rare tumors with severe or life-threatening damage to other system, especially the cardiovascular system. There is also, as we discussed earlier, because 40% of these tumors may have an hereditary cause, it's important to provide genetic counseling. We discuss about uh, obtaining a 24-hour urine or a plasma fractionated metanephrins. We discuss that metanephrins are more sensitive for the diagnosis of and para compared to the catecholamines, but sometimes we obtain catecholamine because some of the tumors may produce dopamine. Once we make the diagnosis of your power, it's important to localize a tumor. As we discussed earlier, some of these paragangliomas may be in multiple places, and that's important to localize a tumor as well. And that's the reason why functional imaging modalities can also help us to characterize a tumor as well to detect metastases. And as we discussed earlier, MIVG and Luthathera are considered treatments for this tumor type, and it can help us evaluate for systemic treatments. We discussed that the first line of medical treatment is an alpha blocker. And I discussed the rationale why it's important an alpha blocker to be given first. When pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma is localized, surgical resection is what we need to do. Now, in terms of the systemic therapy, as we discussed, depending on the disease progression and also the bulk of tumor. And very important that these tumors need to be evaluated by the multidisciplinary team in order to provide the best outcome for these patients. This is my last slide. I would like to thank LACNES for this invitation, especially Lisa, Lindsay, Mary, Donna, Kevia, uh, who are the, also the heart and soul of these organizations. Uh, I also wanted to dedicate this to Giovanna Invesi, which we know is, is the founder in LACNES. Uh, we, miss her, we miss her every day, but we will continue her goal of finding a cure for these neuroendocrine tumors. And that's the reason why I always like to end my presentations that individually were one drop, but together we're an option. So I think in order to advance the science and develop the treatments for these neuroendocrine tumors, we need to all work together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, you talked about working together and working together is definitely what we do. And we really appreciate all the work you do. And Giovanna would be so proud. Her dream was to reach as many people as possible. And today we have people joining us from South Africa, Cambodia, Philippines, all around the world. So thank you for being able to make this information, this education uh, accessible to them. Thank you so much, you. Lisa. What I just wanted to thank you again for the opportunity and for all the patients and caregivers that are listening today. I really thank you for that. And we're here for you. And our goal is to help you in every aspect we can. Thank you. Definitely. Well, with that, there's many questions that have come in. And so let's go ahead and get started with them. So one of the questions that came in was how many people have these cancers and what are the common characteristics among them? So it is considered a rare cancer. Pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas are considered rare cancer. If you want to know the incidence of pheochromocytoma, it's approximately two to eight per million individuals per year that are diagnosed with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. And because of that, 
that meets the definition of a rare cancer. So it is a very rare tumor, and as we discussed in the presentation, they have a very specific characteristics because they have the capacity to produce hormones, and these hormones then can cause symptoms. Um, and uh, we discussed also the difference between pheochromocytomas and pargan gliomas as well, but I think it's important to recognize these tumors and also to recognize them earlier so that way we can provide the best outcome and guidance in terms of follow-up in management mm. yeah it, it does sound like it's rare and while rare it, it also seems like you know it's more common than we may think because there's many people who have registered for this who are watching this and you're definitely not alone in this yeah, absolutely um, another question that came up if malignancy in ppgl is determined solely by the presence of metastasis why do some receive a diagnosis of malignant para um paraphio uh, or paraganglioma based on pathological exam of the tumors? Yeah, that's a good question. And thank you so much for asking that question. And I absolutely agree. So the definition of malignant pheochromocytoma is based on the evidence of metastasis. Metastasis mean that the tumor already traveled to other areas of the body, uh, outside of where the primary tumor was found, uh, but also uh, these um, uh, tumors may also have some local invasion as well in the area. They can also have some lymph node involvement. So sometimes the pathology may want to call it malignant paraganglioma based on some histological findings. And what that means is that these histological findings may also be a risk to develop metastatic disease. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't want to go too much in detail into that, but there are kind of like different score, pathological scores based on the morphology of these neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, one is the pheochromocytoma adrenal gland scale score, and that's something that, you know, is very specific for pheochromocytomas, not necessarily for paragangliomas, and there is another score that the pathology usually use, which is a great insistent for adrenal pheochromocytoma and paragangliomas, and that is the GAP score. The reason why I'm saying this is because sometimes the pathology make the decision if this could have a risk for malignant behavior or metastatic disease based on the histological findings. That means if there is any vascular invasion, if there is any necrosis of the tumor, sometimes uh, there is a, uh, how they look under the microscope, also the K67. So what is the K67? The K67 is the proliferation index of how the cells are able to replicate. And that's usually look under the microscope. And sometimes if there is a specific number, sometimes it can guide us a little bit whether, you know, that could have a more of a malignant behavior. That being said, I don't think this scores has been very well validated. Uh, and also the K67, we don't have, you know, like uh, the information that is established for other neuroendocrine tumors, such, such as the GI pancreas and lung, that we know what the K67 is for, may not necessarily be for pheochromocytoma, but we wanted to integrate now that in our assessment as well on when we want to predict somebody that may develop metastatic disease. Uh, just to summarize, I know that I say a lot, but just to summarize, a malignant pheochromocytoma is based on the evidence of metastasis. It can also be lymph node metastasis, meaning localized. But the reason why the pathologists may call it malignant, it may be because of how it looks under the microscope and the morphological aspects of the tumor based on different scores, even though those scores has not been validated. Thank you for that. That's really helpful. That's really helpful to hear that explanation. Um, so there's several other questions about diagnoses and, and scanning. So um, if I have a pheo in my right adrenal gl gland that's confirmed by MIBG, the scan shows um, it li lit up on the lungs and salivary glands. How do I know if I'm metastatic? Will the biopsy show it? Well, personally, in my own practice and the way if I need to do a functional imaging studies, as I explained on my presentation, I will prefer doing in dotted day scan. It could be the six day gallium dotted day scan or, or the six for copper dotted day scan. There is no difference between the two of them. The same for pheochromocytomas and paraganglioma, the same for other neuroendocrine tumors as the GI and the pancreas is the same sensitivity, meaning that we are able to localize the tumors. Uh, sometimes with, when the dye is injected of the MIBG can go to other places, it can go to the salivary glands, but that doesn't mean that there is a tumor there. 
Uh, I would personally like to look at the scans just to know exactly how the picture is. But if I were concerning that this may have or maybe metastatic disease, I'd rather obtain more information. I may I will obtain a 68 gallon dot of the scan just to understand more about, you know, any metastatic disease or any tumors throughout the body because as we explained earlier the sensitivity of the day scan is quite good for the diagnosis of fios and paras um, and i will not necessarily biopsy until i obtain more information but that's a good question because i have seen some mivgs that they may know that they may be a false positive results meaning that the findings may they may report something but may not necessarily be real and that's when further um, information is needed that being said, the only way that I order an MIVG is when I feel that the patient may benefit from an MIVG treatment. Thank you for that. And another question about scanning, how, lo how large would a FIO and the adrenals need to be in order to be visible on CT scan? So with CT scans, they can be able to, you know, see a small uh, adrenal incidentiloma. Sometimes it's about one centimeter in size. I think they're able to see it. Uh, and uh, once we find this, what we call adrenal incidentilomas, it's important that we do the proper hormonal evaluation. And sometimes when there are certain size, whether it's four or five centimeters in size, usually the surgeons, they say like, let's just remove it as long as all the biochemical evaluation was done to rule out one or the other. Because the adrenal gland not only produce uh, uh, the metanephrines, the hormones, the, um, the adrenaline, but also produce other hormones. When I, in my first uh, two slides, I say that the adrenal gland has two layers. So the outer layer produces three different hormones. One is cortisol, uh, the, which is a stress hormone. The other one is aldosterone, which regulate all your blood pressure in your body, salt and blood pressure as well, uh, salt, uh, salt and potassium as well as your blood pressure. And the other one is the androgens or your sex hormones. But that sometimes we can fight tumors associated with that, but that's why it's always very important that whenever there is an adrenal incidentiloma, they have the proper hormonal evaluation being seen by an endocrinologist so that way they can work the, work the tumors out. And then after that, make the decision on what needs to be done next. Sometimes the CT scan can definitely help us guide whether this is something more concerning. So there are certain units we within the CT scan that they are measured. And sometimes based on the numbers, if it's too high, that can let us think that that, that could be a pheochromocytoma or an adrenocortical cancer or even a metastasis. But I have to tell you, based on the uh, question that is here, I have to say that usually CT scans are able to detect very small adrenal incidentilomas, but once it's detected, proper evaluation needs to be done earlier. Great, thank you for that. And circling back to questions about the functional imaging scan, if the dotate has the highest sensitivity, is there a reason you would scan with MIBG or FDG over the dotate? Yeah. Uh, yes, that's also a good question. So yes, I as I say earlier in my presentation, dotate scans that we discussed has the highest sensitivity. The only way I would do an MIBG scan if, if I feel that the patient may benefit from MIBG treatment, meaning in the metastatic or unresectable setting, that's the only way I would do an MIBG scan. Now, FDG, FDG PET scan, we used to use it a lot before dotted scan. And sometimes we use it whenever dotted scan may not be available or maybe the insurance may not be able to cover. I think nowadays is more accessible. Five, 10 years ago, wasn't as accessible for pheochromocytomas and paracan gliomas. And that's the only way I was requesting an FDG PET scan. Sometimes for patients with succinate dehydrogenase mutation B, sometimes that could be a good scan, but I will always do a dot of these scans to you know, help me determine about what is the extension of tumors, where the tumors are localized over MIVG or over FDG PET scan. Thank you for that. And you talked a lot about genetic testing. Um, how does one get genetic testing? Is it a blood test or a mouth swab? And is there a certain company that should be used? Yeah. Good, that's good. And um, so there are different companies that can do the genetic testing now, because we, as we discussed earlier, approximately 30 to 40% of pheochromocytomas and paraganglioms may be hereditary. So now there is a panel. Whenever we order a genetic testing, there is a panel that covers all mutations associated with pheopara. 
Nowadays, there is different companies that can do it. I, there is no preference. GenDX is one of them, Foundation One, Invita. Those, all of these companies can definitely do the genetic testing and they have a panel for pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. It could be a blood test or it could be a mouse swab because the idea is to extract the DNA either from the blood or from the saliva in order to run the uh, panel for uh, genetic mutations. Um, I, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, and again, you were talking about, you know, uh, biopsying and what complications can arise from a fine needle aspiration and core needle biopsies of a non-secreting paraganglioma? Mm -hmm. Great question. I have to say that our audience today are asking very good questions. Thank you so much for that. And, I, and it's an important question. And the reason why we discuss about the secreting and non-secreting paraganglioma, we discuss that the secreting are the ones that it produces hormones. We discuss the non-secreting paraganglioma doesn't necessarily produce hormone, but if we're going to biopsy or doing an intervention on the tumor, uh, uh, the paraganglioma, usually the non-secreting paraganglioma's are localized in the head and neck. But if we're planning to do an intervention, whether it's a biopsy or any other intervention, surgery, ablation, anything, the patient, we recommend that the patient needs to be on an alpha block or a, on a, a block A medication. It could also be a amlodipine, or it could be a very small dose of doxazosin. And usually the dose for that is very small, it's not a high dose, but we prefer that the patient is in some type of block A prior point to this procedures, even if it's not secreting. And the reason why is because sometimes with them, when they start mobilizing the tumor, they can secrete a little bit of hormones. And that's the reason why, you know, we prefer that. Now, every institution may have different practices as well. So maybe some others may not necessarily give blockade, but we prefer here in our institution to give some type of blockade prior to doing an intervention, even within the not secreting paragangliomas. Thank you for that. Um, and what type of monitoring do you suggest for patients without family history of FIO when genetic testing is denied by health insurance? Mm. Yes, I mean, I difficult question, and and I have to say I have seen a couple of times about that. But what I would recommend, and I really encourage to do that, is for your physician or your genetic genetic counselor to do a peer to peer review because genetic testing is important important for pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, it needs to be done. We discuss again that because of the percentage of these tumors being associated with a germline mutation, it is important that we do it. We really need to um, encourage, you know, the, our physicians, like, again, our, our genetic counselor, so that way they can appeal or have a peer-to-peer -peer review for that genetic testing. Um, and also, and the reason why we wanted to do that is because based on the mutation, they have different screening or surveillance uh, over you know, over the years. And also some of these patients may have, especially the cancer predisposition syndromes may be associated with other tumors for which it's important to have, you know, the right gene that may we, that can help us also guide to do the right surveillance. Um, I have to say that I have, in, have encountered this situation in the past and there is, Invita has a a, a panel for FIOPARA for those patients that may not have insurance. And my understanding is that it's very affordable to do the whole panel through Invita for those patients that don't have insurance. I would still recommend it to definitely, you know, talk to your uh, physician, talk to your genetic counselor. Maybe, I mean, Invita, my understanding is that they have an affordable panel for pheochromocytomas and paraganglioma, but doing this genetic testing is important. It's very important because based on what we found, then we can recommend uh, the right uh, follow-up and surveillance. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, and what is your recommend recommendation in terms of following up metastatic pheochromocytoma after metastectomy? Yes, uh, so I assume maybe the question is after all of the tumors are out, meaning that they resect all of the tumors and maybe there is no, because it could be different scenarios with, with this question. It could be that, you know, a oh, certain area of the body, they resected some of the metastatic disease, but we still have other areas in the bodies. Or it may be that certain area of the body, all the tumors were resected and then there is no evidence of disease. 
Uh, even if there is no evidence of disease because it's already metastatic, we still need to have the adequate surveillance scans, biochemical evaluation, making sure about your blood pressure, your whole clinical history, especially for the secreting pheochromocytomas and paracan gliomas. It's important to also have follow-up scans as well. As we know, some of these tumors may have slow growth, but still we can we need to do scans either every six months or every every year, depending on what is the presentation. But yes, I still it's important to continue follow up closely, especially in the metastatic setting, because there is a risk of recurrence. And also in the in the setting of the succinate dehydrogenase mutation, there may be other paragon gliomas in other parts of the body. So I think it's important to continue surveillance, even if they resect all of the tumors. Thank you. Um, and there's other questions about treatments. What is the possibility or necess necessity of treatment of multiple liver mets with surgery, radioablation, chemoablation for PPGL in the presence of metastases in other organs and bones. So let me just read the question again. What is the possibility, necessity of treatment of multiple liver mets uh, with surgery, uh, chemoablation uh, for in the presence of metastases? Yes, um, good question, and I that's the reason why I say earlier this patients, like all the neuroendocrine tumors, need to be discussed with a multidisciplinary team and with somebody who has an expertise on this tumor type to then, to then give the best outcome. Uh, it's possible that uh, some of these liver metastases may undergo liver ablation or liver embolization. So liver ablation is going through the skin. Liver embolization is usually going through the groin and then going to the one of the arteries in the liver. Um, and uh, it is important to then discuss well with a multidisciplinary team to determine if this is something that could be of help to our patients. Um, it, it can be done. We have done it as well, especially in those patients that we have only a one lesion in the liver. If we see that there is only one lesion in the, li in the liver and nothing else, so either surgery or uh, ablation or embolization to target that lesion could be an option. Sometimes we have seen that the patient may have systemic therapy and we see that other tumors are shrinking or they are stable or that we have we see the benefit but maybe one liver lesion is growing so we usually like to target that with some type of liver ablation embolization but to make that decision it needs to be discussed with a, a multidisciplinary team to make sure that we can have the best outcome for our patient and of course very important every patient that has this procedure needs to be on an alpha blocker yeah those alpha blockers are Really important. Mm -hmm. And what is your in experience in terms of clinical response with systemic chemotherapy, the CVD, in non-resectable metastatic pheochromocytoma? Yes. Uh, yes. And uh, CVD it works for patients with pheochromocytomas and paragon gliomas. The question is, like, when to give it? Um, as I discussed earlier, the, the, I have my, uh, you know, my table, and I explain there when do we need to give chemotherapy versus other systemic therapies. Uh, the, and also we discussed that in our NANET's consensus guidelines as well with a group of experts on pheochromocytomas and paragon gliomas. And usually the recommendation to give a systemic chemotherapy with CBD is for those patients that have large volume of disease, that their, their disease are growing rapidly, or there is causing symptoms, because we wanted to shrink the tumor the fast, the, you know, fastest we can. So that's the reason why CBD chemotherapy is a good option. Um, and, um, and for patients that have metastatic pheochromocytomas or paragon gliomas, something that we wanted to understand, and I think that's where a little bit of our research is going, is based on the different mutations, do we see different responses, whether it's chemotherapy, whether it's tyrosine kinase inhibitors, like I discussed earlier one, like axitinib, cabosantinib, um, and, and others as well. And, uh, and now, even in our studies, in our clinical trials, one of objective is to understand if there is any difference between different mutations in terms of efficacy, but that's something that we're trying to understand. We sometimes feel like CBD may be good for patients with succinate dehydrogenase mutation, but at the same time, like I say earlier, approximately 40% of patients that have metastatic disease may have succinate dehydrogenase mutation or SDHB. Uh, but yes, I, I think it's important to determine what is the uh, volume of disease, what is the growth rate of the disease, if the patient have any symptoms to make the determination about giving chemotherapy. Okay, great. And this may be a little specific. What do you think of taking a laparib, lin 
pa parza alone twice a day. Yeah, la prep, yes. Um, we still don't have data. I know that uh, uh, there is a, a blank on the name of the protocol study, but I know there was initially a phase one to study of using a laparate and then good patients with pheochromocytomas and paraganglioma, and they use a laparate alone. I don't know the results of that study, but I can, what I can tell you is that usually we don't like to give a laparate alone. We like to give a laparate with other uh, treatments, like in this case with tamazolamide. And that, again, this is in the setting of a clinical study, and that's the reason why we're doing the, the study, because we wanted to understand if by either a lap or if the temozolomide could that helps to make temozolomide more effective. Um, and one of the reasons why we're doing that is because um, just to explain a little bit more in detail why we're adding a lab rate to temozolomide is because temozolomide, usually what it does, it breaks the DNA in your body. And sometimes what your body is trying to do is trying to repair itself. And, by, and that can also be the cancer cells as well. And if we give a lab, but it, it can block that regeneration of trying to regenerate those cancer cells. So that's the reason why, you know, we add in a lab rate to temozolomide, and we also add in a lab rate to other treatments because of the same rationale. We can make one treatment more effective. Uh, and I also feel that the lab rate is more, in, uh, the reason why I don't like to give it alone is because it doesn't have the cytotoxic effect, meaning it doesn't kill or shrink the tumors. It is mainly cytostastic, meaning that you may need to give, give it with something else in order to be synergistic. And that's, but, it's, mm -hmm. but there's still a lot of ongoing studies as well. Uh, I may not necessarily give a lab rate, but at the same time, if we wanted to try this, it has to be in the setting of a clinical trial as well. It's not approved for the treatment or management of pheochromocytomas and paraganglioms by itself. So, but we have the study in combination with temozolomide. So that's a good question that we want to answer as well. That is a good question. Um, and thank you for that. So it sounds like the magic of Olaparib is in the synergy with something else. Okay. And uh, speaking of clinical trials, is there clinical trials for metastatic uh, PPGL that are not showing growth? So currently in the watch and wait. Oh. Well, we have the longitudinal studies. Uh, uh, Dr. Carl Patzak is, has a, is, uh, uh, wants to follow patients with metastatic disease over time to understand more about the biology of the disease, and he has a study for that. I think that's what we call a natural history study. So the surveillance is what we call a natural history study, not necessarily a treatment studies. And we do have natural history studies available for at the NIH and Dr. Carl Patzak, I'm sure you, a lot of you may know Dr. Carl Patzak have a story for that to understand more about the biology of metastatic pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas over time just by doing surveillance. Okay, thank you for that. This is a little bit of a case study, so it is a little specific, but say there was someone who comes in with two years of symptoms of catecholamine excess, and the urine VMA was 3.9 times elevated at that time. There's a little bit more information here that isn't on the slide, but um, unfortunately that person was lost to follow up, Oops. And, um, and they came back and the two determinations of urine metanephrines showed normal result, but the other one was 2.6 times elevated. The MRI then showed a left adrenal nodule, half a centimeter. Mm -hmm. Is it safe to say this is pheochromocytoma? Yes, um, that's a, a good question. I mean, if there is symptoms of uh, catecholamine excess, you know, it seems like high blood pressure, increased heart rate, sweating, um, urine VMA may not have the complete workup, and VMA is more specific for other diseases, uh, not necessarily for, uh, for example, succinate dehydrogenase mutation. We don't necessarily routinely measure VMA, uh, and also because it could, we discussed earlier, a lot of these hormones may be affected by other medications or or foods, and you need to keep that in mind. Uh, now, with a very small adrenal nodule, I will have to say that uh, maybe uh, one thing is to also make sure that there is how the two adrenal glands looks like. Some of these adrenal glands may have a little bit of hyperplasia, uh, meaning that there is a little bit of enlarged, a little bit more like fatty inside of the cells, uh, and that make them look a little bit bigger. Uh, and then we have this mild elevation of these catecholamines hormones. And if there are symptoms, sometimes we like to add a medication just for symptomatic control. It will be difficult to resect uh, 
the tumor this small, but again, that would be a question for the surgeon is that would be an approach that they would like to proceed. But I would just have to say, I mean, I don't have a lot of the information here to really have a definite answer, but uh, uh, urine VMA may not be enough to have the diagnosis of pheochromocytomas and paraganglioma. But that being said, because of the symptoms and the adrenal nausea, I would definitely like to have a close follow-up. Okay. And this question is about symptoms. Can one have really good days and then really bad soaking wet days with pheochromocytoma? Yeah. yeah, a lot of my patients, that's one of the things about, you know, the secreting pheochromocytomas and paraganglioma. It could be why, you know, patients can, they have a lot of discomfort, they don't feel well. Uh, it is one of the sweatings that they're, like you say, you know, sucking wet, and those are one of the symptoms. It's possible that there may be some difference, you know, it's unrelated necessarily to the activity or maybe even to the hormone levels. But yes, every day is, is different for our patients with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas. And I can understand some of these symptoms may be quite, you know, you may feel, you know, not happy about some of these symptoms, but it's important that we continue watching. If you feel like these are the symptoms and your blood pressure is very elevated, we need to make sure that you are uh, taking the medication needed. We discuss about the alpha blocker, we discuss about the beta blocker. Sometimes Demser can help, even though we discuss that it's a medication that is expensive and not widely available everywhere. But I think having a symptom diary of how you feel, so that way we can definitely target those symptoms. But I can understand so our patients with pheopar, especially this and yes, there's a lot of symptoms and it's not at the best quality of life, but we definitely want to improve that. And you definitely need to talk to your doctors about this just to make sure that you have the medic adequate medication that we treat the tumor, if it's localized, if it's metastatic, because by treating the tumors that can also lower the hormone excess and that can also help with some of these symptoms. So I think that's important. And as I discussed earlier, multidisciplinary team uh, with an expert in this disease is important uh, because I can always guide you what would be the best uh, uh, treatment follow-up uh, for our patients. But yes, important that have the right medication. If there is tumors that needs to be resected or ablated to help some of these tumors to some of the symptoms to decrease the hormones, that would be another option. But again, that needs to be discussed with your doctors and a multidisciplinary team. Thank you for that. Um, and you talked a lot about anesthesia and surgery, um, possibly triggering a crisis. So does one need to be concerned about triggering a crisis with oral surgery and dental procedures? or even regular dental cleanings? Um, n not necessarily. It's usually the crisis are given whenever we're close to the tumor uh, that may be somehow mobilized to the tumors. Now, most of the secreting paragangliomas or pheochromocytomas, they need to have the adequate medication to prevent crisis from happening. Now, that being said, as I discussed earlier, some of our patients with pheochromocytomas and paragangliomas, they have a, you know, they undergo uh, surgery for unrelated, you know, uh, costs not necessarily to the pheopara, or they may need to have a biopsy for other reasons, or they may need, they need to put on their anesthesia or surgery. Sometimes that can cause a crisis, and it's usually because of the vicinity or close to the tumors where they're lo localized. If you have the right medication, if you're taking the beta blocker and your blood pressure is under control, even if you have an oral surgery, dental procedure, it shouldn't necessarily look, cause a significant crisis. But I will definitely, in my mind, every patient that has secreted needs to have and uh, the appropriate medication with any procedure. And that's usually what I recommend. Thank you. And speaking of uh, medications, how would you adjust treatment for a patient whose catecholamine is high in dopamine? Um, so uh, dopamine. So we discussed earlier about the difference between catecholamines and the difference metanephrines and catecholamines. And some uh, paragangliomas, especially the paragangliomas, may secret dopamine. Usually dopamine may not have as, you know, intense symptoms, like with the high blood pressure, the uh, increase in the heart rate, um, so those patients, the patients that have high levels of dopamine, what we have seen that the blood pressure goes low. And in those situations, we need to be very cautious of what medications we give in those patients, but it doesn't cause the other symptoms like the high blood pressure, the, uh, the increase in the heart rate and so forth. 
a lot of the times dopamine, dopamine may be elevated but may not cause any symptoms uh, and we may not necessarily use any blockade for that and again if it's, sometimes we see when the dopamine is very high sometimes we see symptoms but that's usually low blood pressure and we need to be cautious about the medications that they receive thank you for that and you know the last thing i'll just ask you as we close our q a is what are you ho most hopeful for in 2022 and what hope could you offer our pop our patient population i have to say i love this question and the reason why is because i i'm we're we feel very hopeful uh in this year and the coming years and the reason why is because now there has been a lot of discoveries, especially in the genomics of pheochromocytomas and paragon gliomas. There are now more clinical trials available for pheochromocytomas and paragon glioma than what it was five or 10 years ago. So I think now we are understanding more about these tumors and we're able to determine how we can help them. And of course, you know, I feel very hopeful this year and for the years to come. There is now more uh, physicians that have an interest on in your endocrine tumors as well, and that's the very exciting to see because the more we are studying these tumors, the, be the better we work together as a team. Um, and as well for pheochromocytomas and paragon gliomas. But as I say earlier, I always like to discuss my pheos and paras as a team, uh, just to make sure that we have the best outcome. And I'm very fortunate that here at the NIH, I work with Dr. Carl Patza, which is a world you know, recognized expert in this field. And he has dedicated his life for the treatment of these tumors. So I think that I'm very, very hopeful. I, and I always say it as well that in order to move the science forward, we need to work as a team. I always feel like patients are our number one priority. Patients are our uh, our inspiration to move forward. Uh, we And we wanted to do better every day because of you. And I think that we're here for you. You're not alone, as Lisa said earlier. And we now we have these amazing support groups. And I feel like this is important as well to move the science because you're increasing the awareness of this tumor. So that's why you are group as a patient is important because you're increasing the awareness to that 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 way everybody can hear and that way we can as a physician who saw that these tumors can also develop better therapies for you all i'm very hopeful again and i, I and i just i'm here for you and uh and there are more treatments to come and i'm i'm grateful to be here well you inspire us and we're so grateful for you your dedication your hard work your passion um we, it gives us hope as well from the, the patient community. And we're so grateful for you joining us for this excellent presentation for this uh, wonderful Q&A. And we look forward to a more extended Q&A next week as well. So I'll thank see you, you so all much. day. Please come to the extended Q&A. Yes. You know, we're here to help yes. you. Just come. <laughs> Yes, that's right. Well, thank you. And as we close, as we come to a close at the end of the webinar, as Dr. Del Rivera was saying, we do this for patients and for the, the, the community, for those who are touched by um, these diseases. And so uh, with that in mind, we have a special story um, of a caregiver. Her name is Amy Powell. She's one of our uh, NetConnect mentors. Uh, Amy Powell is uh, well known to us in the LACNETS community. And her involvement with the net cancer community has as a whole has its roots in her work as a caregiver for family members who are diagnosed with uh, pheochromocytoma and perigaline glioma. She's worked in the administrative capacity for nonprofits since 2005, and she's been a professional communicator for over 25 years. After her brother's um, passing, or after her brother's death from malignant perigaline glioma, she dedicated herself to raising awareness of para and pheos and to assisting patients with these rare diseases. Amy is the founder of Pheopara Project and currently sits on the board of director for the SDH Deficient Cancer Research Advocates. So we're fortunate to be able to hear a story from Amy. Welcome, Amy. Hi, I'm Amy Powell, a caregiver with family members who had pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma, two rare neuroendocrine tumors. Like many families, our family was dealing with neuroendocrine tumors long before anyone in the family received a formal diagnosis. My grandmother had tumors from her neck and abdomen removed in the late 1950s and early 1960s. And my mother was diagnosed with resistant high blood pressure when she was 20 years old. When I was a child, my earliest memories are of my mom feeling ill, sequestering herself in her bedroom because she had bad headaches. She'd been 
sweaty the night before, she was feeling dizzy and sick. Um, I knew what high blood pressure was and some of the effects that it caused before I could learn to read. Um, when I was growing up, my mom saw many doctors trying to understand why she didn't feel well. In the 1980s, she went through periods of uh, blackouts and dizziness that were so severe she traveled to from rural Kansas to larger communities near us for workups and no one put the pieces together with my grandmother's uh, medical history and at that time my mom didn't have any tumors that we knew about so it was actually uh, suggested that she might even have multiple sclerosis um, and that might be causing her health issues. Um, even when my brother John received a diagnosis of carotid body tumor in 2005 and had that tumor removed, no one connected the dots. And we didn't either, to be fair. We had no idea that these tumors existed. Um, no one told us that a carotid body tumor was a paraganglioma and was related to something called pheochromocytoma. Um, and my brother was assured that his tumor was sporadic and benign and other than um, permanent damage to his vocal cords and ability to speak, he would not have any lasting problems from it. It wasn't until February of 2014 that my mom was finally diagnosed with pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma after she had a heart attack that had no apparent cause. At this time, we did know that she had tumors in her neck and abdomen, but again, we had been assured that they were benign. And even though we asked, um, we'd also been assured that they were unrelated to the tumor that my brother had been diagnosed with. Um, later that year, my brother told me he thought his tumor was recurring. And in December of 2014, I accompanied him to the NIH when he was uh, evaluated at the National Institutes of Health, his tumor had gone from being not noticeable at the beginning of 2014 to about six centimeters. So it came back aggressively and um, he had surgery the following year, but died of complications afterward. Um, my involvement with the NET support communities began after that because I, you know, had sort of a lot of energy and uh, that I had intended to direct into his care and um even though i was still managing my mom's care remotely uh she was stable and not taking an aggressive treatment route because her health had been so damaged over the years by excess adrenaline hormones that surgery really wasn't advised and she didn't have a lot of new masses appearing so i uh, decided to take the energy that i would have spent on my brother and use it um, in his honor to help other pa patients with similar tumors. Um, I connected with the Pheopara Troopers, which has now become the Pheopara Alliance. And I uh, also connected with LACNETS in 2016. Um, events like today's webinar are so important for the Pheopara community because it not only provides much needed information to Pheopara patients and current information to Pheopara patients, but uh, it also helps to raise the profile of these underdiagnosed tumors. Um, and it helps patients and healthcare providers alike understand where we are currently in our um, research and, and understanding of these tumors. Um, if I were talking to my brother or my mother today, I would make sure that they visited a geneticist, which, you know, was something that took a little bit to get going for us because uh, when mom was diagnosed, most of her doctors had only heard of one genetic mutation that caused FIO or para, and that was not one that um, would have fit the expression of the disease within our family. Um, and we now know that there are roughly 20 genes that are implicated in the formation of these tumors and about 
uh, 12 inherited syndromes that can be associated with pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma. So visiting with a geneticist is an important step in taking control of your disease and moving forward with your life. And understanding your medical history within your family is also a very important part of that. That's probably the best advice that I could give to anyone is to understand your medical history and understand how your personal diagnosis can affect the medical path forward for multiple members of your family. And this is why it's so important to get genetic testing if it's offered and to ask about it if it's not. Um, it's a scary thing and it isn't necessarily news that anyone wants to get, but being um, forewarned is being forearmed as, as the saying goes, it's much better to go into something knowing that you may have something to worry about and, and being ready to take that on than to go into something blind. And I would say our family definitely went into this blind. And um, I believe firmly that my brother's prognosis in particular would have been much better if we'd understood the diagnosis that he received in 2005. And it would have enabled us to be much more proactive with my mother before she received symptoms. And looking back, truly, it was more than 50 years from my grandmother's last surgery until my mother received her diagnosis. 50 years of our family wondering why our, our medical history was so strange and, and filled with lots of apparently benign tumors and, and hypertension in, in otherwise very healthy and young family members. And um, it would have been good to have this information. It, it could have really possibly affected both my mother's life and my brother's and um, has definitely been a positive for the rest of us going forward as we've looked at our own personal medical histories and um, our children's. So. Um, I'd like to thank LACNETS for having this uh, webinar today and giving me the opportunity to talk about my family history and for the important work that they do and the opportunity to work with them on the NetConnect team and in, interact with other pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma patients. And it's important to know if you are diagnosed or suspect that you have pheochromocytoma and paraganglioma that LACNETS has good educational materials on these tumors and can connect you with a good doctor in the area if uh, you need to see someone who is knowledgeable about these particular types of neuroendocrine tumors. In addition, the Pheopara Alliance has some good educational resources and um, has partnered with the with LACNETS in the past and, and there's a lot of love and support going both ways, I think, between those organizations. And definitely um, the FIO Para Alliance can also help you connect with a knowledgeable professional. If you're a healthcare professional, both organizations also have a lot of good information from you. And um, I think, I hope that we can make more families paths better than maybe my family's path was initially um, so that, you know, the Johns and moms of the world um, have an easier time of it. Thank you, Lisa and Dr. Del Rivero. Be sure you're following LACNETS on social media. We have Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Stay up to date on upcoming webinars and net news. We offer many programs and resources, including our weekly net support group, a dedicated caregiver only support group, Net Vitals, which is a downloadable patient-physician communication tool to help you prepare for your medical appointments, and health coaching that's available to net patients or caregivers. We encourage you to go to our website, lacnets.org, to find out more information about our programs, view resources, read blogs, take net quizzes, and much more. Last fall, LACNETS launched our new podcast featuring local net experts who answer the top 10 questions in their field. We hope you'll take a listen. We will be releasing one episode every month, so stay tuned for more. Thanks again for our special guest for today, Dr. Hydera Del Rivero. We're grateful for all you do for the net cancer community. And thank you to Rich at TVP Live for all you do and for all of you for joining us today. Goodbye and see you next month.
Bye.